Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors. To out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. Happy New Year, everybody. It is Whiskey Wednesday, January 6th, 2021, and you're listening to episode 28. Today, we speak with Brendan McCarran and David Blackmore of Glen Morangi about two of the brand's amazing expressions. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Tokai is a beautiful place in Hungary, and it happens to be the country's most famous wine region. The geography of the region is shaped by its natural borders. There, one will find the town of Tokai, at the southwest corner of the region, where the Tissa and Badrog rivers meet. Wine is traditionally grown on a small plateau that's 1,500 feet above sea level. This area is also protected by nearby mountains, giving the region a unique climate. Even more interesting is the area's soil. Its volcanic origins, with high concentrations of lime and iron, render it rich in tufa, zeolite, and rhyolite. The exact date when grapes were first grown on the confluence of the two rivers is unknown. According to legend, however, the first Tokai Azu was made in 1630. We do know, however, that Tokai wine was the world's first appellation of controlled origin, established before both port and Bordeaux wines. Vineyard classification began in 1730, and by 1757, a royal decree established a closed production district in Tokai. Following the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Treaty of Trianon was signed. As a result, in 1920, a small part of the Tokai region was ceded to Czechoslovakia. After World War II, Hungary fell under Soviet influence, and nationalization carried out in the years to follow eliminated large estates and created communist cooperatives. And because the new state-mandated production goal was quantity over quality, Hungarian wine, along with its reputation, suffered. But since the collapse of the communist regime in 1990, many independent wineries have established themselves in the Tokai region and are focused on rejuvenating Hungarian wine production and building a global brand. So why is a whiskey show talking about wine? Because this dessert wine will make you want to have your cake and eat it too. Up next, we speak with Brendan McCarran and David Blackmore of Glen Morangi about their limited release expression, A Tale of Cake. Stay with us. Hey, do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, A Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right, the project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can, by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives. And to make a pledge. Visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Now. Well, I, I think it's a cheers to that. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> cheers. cheers. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, we are tag-teaming Brendan McCarran who is head of maturing whiskey stocks at the Glen Morangy Company and Ardbeg, as well as Mr. David Blackmore, uh, who is the global brand ambassador at Glen Morangy and also Ardbeg. Brendan and David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Looking forward to it. I'm so glad to have you back, David. 
Yes, David, thank you for rejoining us. Yes. We had David with us a few months ago. Brendan, I have to tell you, that title is so technically on the nose, head of maturing whiskey stocks. You know, it's uh, it's like- And bonds or just stocks? <laughs> <laughs> I did a Philip. You did. I'm, 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 I did a Philip. I'm king of the dad jokes. They call me the Punisher. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very technically spot. It's like, this is what I do. Yeah, yeah, it kind of <laughs> it is and it isn't. So, I mean, really, my job is I'm one of the whiskey makers at the Glenmondry Company. So, I'm a member of the whiskey creation team. Mm-hmm. So, I help to host, taste, and make all of our whiskey. But, yeah, uh, a large part of my focus, which is pretty cool. As I suppose technically, I am responsible for every single cask we buy, what we fill into every single cask, and then I'm responsible for them right up until we pour them out of those casks and, and make a brand new whiskey, either a brand new... Wow. What goes in, what comes out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That sounds like one of the most fascinating jobs in whiskey, actually. I would say so, yeah. I would say so. I mean, it's genuinely, it's coming up for seven years now that I'm in the role. And I guess nothing in life is guaranteed, but I was hired with a view to being the next master distiller, master blender. So Mm -hmm. protege to my boss, Dr. Bill Lumsden. Mm -hmm. Yes. A legend in his own time. Yeah, absolutely. That's the probably most famous person in Scotch whiskey, if not whiskey period, as you guys say in America. Uh, Full, (laughs) as we say here. Um, But yeah, about seven years ago, I got the job. and, And honestly, seven years ago, You would have found me on Isla, and I'll talk a bit about my career, but I would say seven years ago, if you'd said to me, do do you want to leave the job you're in right now? I'd have said no way, because I genuinely thought then I had the best job on earth, and it was pretty close, but yeah, this one's even better. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. It sounds like you've already had a fantastic whiskey journey, but let's start at the very beginning. When you were a wee little lad, did you have aspirations to be a whiskey maker? And then tell us how you got from your first idea of working in whiskey to where you are today? So, uh, no. <laughs> and I love this. I, I love it. And, and more power to them. I, I love the people who say, you know, when I was four years old, <laughs> I didn't want to work in the whiskey industry. And I'm like, wow, that's good for you. But when I was four, I wanted to be a train driver. And then oh, fun. A, an astronaut and, you know, all the stereotypical ones. Uh, right. But, you know, like, when I was growing up, I was a very keen footballer. So, I guess the thing I really wanted to be was a footballer, but mm-hmm. I was good enough to get to a reasonable level, but I wasn't good enough to become a professional. So as that started to clear out, I know my parents wanted me to be a doctor because my uncle, who I'm named after, my uncle Brendan is a doctor. So I think they wanted me to be a doctor, but I, I didn't really know what I wanted to be, frankly, until sort of halfway through university. When I got to the end of high school, and they, they suddenly say, right, you've, got, you've passed all your exams, so you're going to university. What do you want to do? I think I wanted to be a historian because like, I got the highest mark I got was in history. So I figured nice. right, that, that makes sense. And mm-hmm. I still have an obsession with history and I could just read historical articles all day long. I find it fascinating. And I guess that will ease back into whiskey. Mm-hmm. But it's good at maths and it's good at chemistry. So I did chemical engineering at university. And then when you do chemical engineering, Lots of the jobs are in places that make something and kind of a little bit of luck because I started off in the pharmaceutical industry, but a little bit of luck, a little bit of serendipity uh, meant that I ended up moving back to Scotland and I joined the whiskey industry. And then there's been no looking back since then. Mm -hmm. Oh, but see, if you'd stayed in pharmaceuticals, you could have saved us all from COVID. Possibly. (laughs) And I think, look, in a way... I would say that Brendan's done it okay anyway. He's saved a lot of us yeah. for the, uh, and, and got I was just us through say, this year. In, 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 a, <laughs> in a matter of speaking, he has. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I may mean, not have killed the virus, but I've certainly killed hours and hours and <laughs> millions across the world for people. Brendan, where did you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in a little town called Coatbridge. It's about 10 miles outside Glasgow. So mm, okay. close to Glasgow. Um, mm-hmm. Was where I was. Rural raised. or suburban? Suburban. Okay. Suburban. It's a thousand people. Okay. Uh, kind of, right. It used to be an old, old mining town. Aha. Uh-huh. Was it a spirited family? Were they spirits aficionados or would they drink the odd dram? Oh, God, no. Not aficionados. I mean, they were spirited in that they would drink stuff and there was maybe some turpentine in the garage. But apart from that. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> my dad was a whiskey fan. You know, my dad did liked whiskey, big smoky whiskey fan. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he drink whiskey, wasn't it? You know, he'd drink whiskey, not 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 an aficionado. I think he would eat to be mm-hmm. described as that. And the rest, of them, not really. No, not none of the rest of them really drink whiskey at all. Okay, that sounds like a fun family. Drinking, but not drinking, but kind of drinking. <laughs> anyway, so when you moved out of pharmaceuticals, what was your very first job in whiskey? Yeah, so I joined Diageo in 2006, and I joined on their graduate scheme. So I was one of, I think I was only one of three people picked that year. So it was quite a competitive scheme to get into, and somehow I pulled it off. And then they said, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be based? And so most of the people chose based on geography. So whereabouts in Scotland are they from? Or maybe try and move to Glasgow or Edinburgh, one of the big cities. But I, I genuinely said, look, I'll go wherever the best job is. So wherever the best job, best learning opportunity is, send me there. So my very first job was working at Burkhead Maltings. So Burkhead is one of the largest drum maltings on earth. So it's where you take barley in from the merchants and you malt it. So you germinate it and kiln it to turn it into malting barley that you then send to the distillery. And I still stand by this, and there's a lot of people who do, is before you can be a distiller or to be a great distiller, you need to know how to malt. You need to know the entire malting process. It's a magical mix of art and science, just like distilling. I didn't know at the time, but I'm so glad that I started as a maltster before I then progressed into being a distiller. How long were you a maltster? And was it a dirty job or was it not so dirty? Yeah, it was a yeah, Christina Aguilera style dirty. <laughs> Oh nasty, nasty. Um, no, no, no. Malting is it is a big job. You know, you're making barley grow, and it grows roots, rootlets that you then remove. You try to keep it warm. It's a food stuff, so if you don't clean it up, it's dusty. Mm-hmm. If you don't clean that up, it attracts whole sorts of you know people try to get a free feed. So it is like a dirty job, but it's it's an amazing job as well, and it's it's on a a sort of much bigger scale than like a, a malt whiskey distillery, which is much smaller, you know. Mm-hmm. So I sat at Burkhead for a year, but also at the same time as I was at Burkhead, Diageo made the decision to build the first single malt whiskey distillery in 40 years, which was Rosile. And because I was a chemical engineer, I actually got a side hustle, which was to help design that distillery, which was like amazing for me. Amazing for my learning and just amazing for just really lucky timing to be there when they made this decision. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's really cool. And after that, you went on to Oban and Lagavulin. I mean, talk about name dropping. Wow. The professional journey from joining the Diageo graduate program and helping design Rosile. Talk to us about that. I mean, those are quite a few big name stops along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It has been really, really cool. I kind of need to pinch myself every so often when I look back. At, <laughs> um, you know, the, the eight years that I had at Diageo, there was just so much progression and development and learning. And that's why Dr. Bill wanted me to come and work here. And that's why the company saw me as the right person to take over from him when the time was right. But yeah, it was amazing. So I moved from working at Burkhead and Roseisle. I then moved down to Leaven, where I was in the blending department. So I wasn't like a master blender who knows his own taste. I was physically running the team who empty the casks and blend up the whiskies. So I guess that's where, you know, my sensory started to develop, was at the maltings and then in the blending. Mm-hmm. I then got to do a year <clears throat> in America. So I used to live in Connecticut. I was in Fairfield County, so just outside New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did a year in procurement. So that was enough. That was the one year where I haven't worked directly with single malt whiskey. Mm-hmm. But I learned a lot about just, that's the biggest market in the world for single malt. I learned a huge amount about how much whiskey is enjoyed out in America. I learned a huge amount about just how a big business works as well. So it's also proved invaluable. And it's also where I picked up my uh, American accent. <laughs> <laughs> so you've effectively done every job on the shop floor. Yeah. So actually, because of I then moved to Isla. When I came back from America, I moved to Oban mm-hmm. and I became distillery manager. And there I was, um, I actually got into the newspapers because I was the youngest distiller in Scotland. So I got that job when I was 28, 20, yeah, I was 28. So when I got the job at Oban, I was actually the youngest person on site Mm -hmm. and I was in charge. Really cool. Then I moved to Isla. (laughs) That has its challenges. Oh, it definitely does. It definitely does. And I was quite weary of it, but I've worked with some really amazing teams, but 
I think that was the best team I ever worked in, was the Oban team. Mm-hmm. They were just a phenomenal bunch of men and women. They were really incredible. And they were really supportive of me. But also, they really didn't take any of my snacks when I was being cocky and young. You know, <laughs> so they sort of got me into shape at the same time. But they also, I think, I mean... I was very sad to leave there. I spent two incredible years there, and it's, it's some of the happiest memories I've ever had. Uh-huh. But then I moved there. Uh, it was quite funny. So Oban's on the west coast of Scotland. So my boss said, big news, Brendan. I'm moving you out west. So I thought I was going back to America. And he went, <laughs> <laughs> so I was a little island in between Scotland and America, but much closer. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Oban. It's beautiful. I love it. It's right there on the on the water. It's great. Yeah, see, and that's the classic American pronunciation there, Oban. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You say Oban. Oban. Oban, indeed. The funny thing is, there's loads of Scottish people say the Americans can't pronounce Oban or Oban, but actually, I think the Americans are saying it right, and it's just Scottish accent says Oban. Aha, aha. Beautiful little place. David, let's bring you in here. Sure. Brendan referred to the global market for whiskey, for single malt scotch, and America being the largest. Indeed. And you are a native of Edinburgh, I believe. I am. You know, they had to have somebody from the right side of Scotland. Indeed. Okay, (laughs) good, good, good. We're making it rain. We're making it rain here. (laughs) So you were based... But yeah, it's funny that, it's funny that, because it's actually, you know, a Glaswegian, it just rains all the time Ah, over there. Okay. (laughs) So you're based in Dallas. I am. So you're figuratively and literally in the middle of it all. I am, yeah. Tell us a bit about your journey and how you landed in Dallas. Yeah, so born and raised in Edinburgh, went to university, went to college at St. Andrews, ended up with a science degree, with a biology degree, environmental biology degree, but really still didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I, I at one point nearly went to Glasgow School of Art, but ended up with a science degree from St. Andrews. Sort of bummed around Edinburgh for a few years after graduating, really not knowing what I was doing. And then one thing led to another, and I got a job at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, which was pretty much only about a year after my love of single malt whiskey had started. And I really fell head over heels in love with single malt Scotch whiskey because of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. It was through the society that I first bumped into Dr. Bill Lumsden at Whiskey Live London. It must have been... 2004, I'm guessing, uh, Whiskey Live London. And I, uh, I got hold of Bill Lumsden's business card and wouldn't let it go. And I, <laughs> I, I called him one week and emailed him the next week. And I did that, repeated that for an entire year until he finally said, listen, here's a job. Now, sod off to the US, <laughs> get out of my hair, <laughs> which is pretty much it, I'm afraid. So yeah, I've landed in the US at Newark Airport with a one-way ticket, two suitcases. That was 16th of September, 2005. Wow. I remember it well. Yeah. How did the two of you connect? That's what I was just going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Where and when? It begs the question. So it was, actually, it was actually through this job. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the parts. So you've got to remember, when I was working at Deep, I was doing all the production stuff, you know. So I was distillery manager or maltster or distillery designer. So doing every stage of making malt. But I wouldn't really get out into the front-facing stuff, you know. So I wouldn't get out into marketing yeah. so much. I did know a mutual friend of David and I that is a great ambassador for Diageo uh, called Ewan. Awesome guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ewan's like, like Ewan's a top guy. I try to recommend you speak to him. So yeah, he's one of the ambassadors. So I got to know Ewan and I got to know that group. But I wouldn't meet ambassadors from other places. I'm very defensive of Diageo. I had an amazing time there. But when you're in Diageo, it's so big. You tend to just meet people from Diageo. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't met David until I got this job. Yeah. And actually, on my first day, so my very first day in Edinburgh with Bill, uh, David was in town for various meetings and you know david he's quite not boastful enough about part of his role but <laughs> when he's back in scotland he's in with us we are the whiskey makers but we have david in there to nose and taste and get his opinion you know i also say my job is amazing it's the dream job but the bit that i get the most excited about these days is the fact that i get invited in 
to that. Um, very privileged mm. to be able to come into the sensory lab and nose and taste. And, you know, once in a while, they'll ask me, have you got any ideas for products, uh, new products, any crazy ideas? And I'm flattered that they, <laughs> <laughs> that they ask me. So, yeah, you're a, and even once or twice, they actually take them seriously. <laughs> you're a member of the whiskey creation team, are you not? Well, yeah, very junior one. Ah, you know, okay. Part time when I get back, that's for sure. I wouldn't ever say that I am a whiskey maker. I am a whiskey consumer mostly, <laughs> and I like talking about it. But yeah, I, I've been part of um, a fair few kind of what we call our think tanks, where we come up with um, we bounce off off the wall all sorts of crazy ideas. Yeah, and that it's it's exhilarating being part of that team mm-hmm. for sure. Well, it's unusual, I think, yeah. for a for an ambassador to have the opportunity to play such a role. Yes, and I'm very privileged to have that role. And I think it's very enlightened of the Glamorangy company because, you know, as Brendan said, if you're in a, I know that now you know, he gets out in a normal year, he'd be out and about getting out into the market fairly often. But, you know, Bill and Brendan and the rest of that team, their day jobs are you know, exactly that, making the whiskey. Whereas my day job is at, at the call face, seeing the reaction of consumers and, and bartenders and such like. So it, it's very enlightened of the company to allow me to give that feedback of what's happening, what do you see, what are people getting into, you know, the, the trends. And I, hopefully I, I, I really add something to that. <laughs> Brendan, <laughs> Brendan, does, <laughs> does, Brendan, does David add something to that? He does. He okay. does. He adds okay. a certain level of noise, you know, and noisiness. And no, of course he does. <laughs> he does. I mean, David has, I would say, a hundred ideas in a time that I have two, and I have a lot of ideas. So, great <laughs> <laughs> energy to bounce off. But that's that is how we met. So, my very first day, David was in the office sure. with me for lunch, and we went to a, just just like a very very random little place and had a a bowl of pasta and you did a chat and you, you knew, you knew that we were going to hit it off. You got that, you, yeah. you know when that happens. And then since then, when I'm out in the marketplace, David's uh, there for most of the time. We're not allowed to spend the whole time together. Yeah, he definitely adds a lot. You know, yeah. if you're looking to make whiskies for people out in the world and you're just going with your own ideas all the time, it's going to very quickly become quite monotone. Mm-hmm. So yeah. having lots of different, and lots of different things. Right. Fantastic, and having David's exuberance, which is <laughs> so yeah, David's exuberance combined with his cynicism, it, it makes <laughs> yeah. it's it's true. Like, I'm quite oh. cynical at times as well. I try to knock that on the head. So, the but, mutual man um, crush is working for both of you. <laughs> it is. My wife's got some issues with it, as has David's. Yeah. Brother. When Brendan said we're not allowed to, you know, be together all the time when we're traveling, he just means, you know, during the, the hours of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this, right? The T and E budget of the company was being cut. That's why we shared that room. That's why we <laughs> You know, booking a room with a single bed was taking it a bit far, though, Brendan. Come on, now. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that's a tight fit. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we won't go there. Exactly. <laughs> Let's, move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. All right. All right. I'm imagining the two of you in that scene with John Candy and um, – uh, Steve yes. Martin on uh, planes, trains, and automobiles with the pillow. Yeah. <laughs> the travels we've done together, there have been many kind of planes, trains, and automobile moments, including yeah. Brendan. One you probably don't want to particularly remember, but do you remember the uh, the, the uh, almost aborted attempt to get on the Amtrak yes. from Seattle to Portland? <laughs> what disaster that was. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Our listeners would like to hear it. <laughs> sure. Oh, uh, well, yeah, it turns out that the West Coast Amtrak is very different from the East Coast Amtrak. Indeed. Now, uh, the East Coast, when you get on the Acela or something, you don't have to check your suitcases, you know? You can just take them on. Well, we got to the station in Seattle and we're told, no, no, you have to check those bags. You can't take them on. And then we found out that it was a, a, a Amtrak policy that you can't take alcohol in your checked luggage. No, and that no. was a big problem because we had all sorts of samples. So uh, anyway, we managed to negotiate in the end <laughs> and everything worked out. You had to give samples to the guy. I see how that goes. Uh, it was as simple as this. It was uh, we're turning around and taking the plane and never taking Amtrak again, or you can take our bags. 
<laughs> no questions asked. That's funny. And it worked. <laughs> well, that's good. You didn't even yeah. have to bribe him. That's amazing. No, nope. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so speaking about samples, we today are going to talk about a Tale of a Cake and Signet, yep. um, which are two different ones than we talked to David about last time. So I'm interested, Brendan, to find out your role in the making of A Tale of Cake, because this is a very intriguing dram to me. Yeah, so so my role was I helped to make it. So <laughs> I'm part of the whiskey making team. So I got to be involved at the, every stage, so purchasing the casks, uh, choosing what went into the casks, um, all under Dr. Bill's guidance and leadership, you know, Dr. Bill's his name that goes on every bottle and he is our leader but I'm involved at every stage uh, writing the tasting notes making my recommendation on strengths on which cast we use which cast we don't and also I got to do the global launch of it as well which is pretty cool so Dr Bill was, was out the office that week and so they said okay we'll rearrange it we'll we delay it and stuff and he sort of said no just Brendan will do it so that was cool so yeah, I'm involved in every stage of making these whiskies, and this mm-hmm. one, a tail of cake, is pretty cool, even if I say so myself. So obviously I'm biased, but what I love about a tail of cake is we, we, we make lots of amazing whisky, and we have lots of cool ideas, and we have lots of cool innovations and experimentations, but what I love about this one is this was like an idea for how a whisky would taste that we had, and then we had to... We had an idea of how we wanted a whiskey to taste, and then we had to make a whiskey get to that kind of set of tasting notes that we had in our head. And that's extremely challenging, extremely challenging. There was a bit of retro engineering. You had a flavor profile you wanted to achieve. Yeah, so most of the innovations and experiments we have is, or we get our hands on some very cool casks, or we do some longer fermentations at the distillery, or we do something with, we get a different type of barley in, so we know that it's going to be different, okay? But we don't know how it's going to be different. But we do the experiment, and then if it comes out as something amazing, mm-hmm. then great, we've got a whisk to tell people about. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's a bit like, oh, I don't know, like throwing a dart at a dartboard and it lands on the dartboard. So you're like, yeah, yeah, it landed where we were kind of aiming. But this way around, we genuinely were thinking about we were getting in touch with our emotions at the whiskey creation. <laughs> it is a new age, Iron John. <laughs> you're like, damn right, damn right. <laughs> What the world needs now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to unite people. Right? We should be sitting in a circle here. Right. We should be sitting in a circle holding hands. <laughs> That's so not COVID compliant. <laughs> that is true. That is <laughs> yes. true. Well, it could be a very large circle. And that's why I chose to be 92 proof so that you can rub that in your hands and then we can all get that's Okay, true. all right, that's all right. True. How did you happen upon Tokai? Yeah. Because whiskey finished in Sherry, Port, Madeira, even Sotern, long tradition. But Tokai, Hungarian dessert wine, I mean, that's just not something you see. How'd you get there? Yeah, so the idea comes first. The idea was we were talking about happiness or joy, I think was the word. You know, do you know we want to make a whiskey that is happy, a whiskey that puts a smile on your face, you know, a whiskey that is, without taking away from it, isn't something that's super serious and super traditional, you know? Because if you want to make a whiskey that's 40 years old, I think it deserves to be traditional and it requires respect and it requires a level of knowledge. And that's all fine, but it definitely takes you back to that kind of traditional view of Scotch whiskey. But we were thinking about how do we make something that's just fun, how do we make something that kind of captures that kind of joy that we have when we come into the lab and make whiskies and, you know, the, the industry that we work in? So we started thinking about that and we started playing off each other. Like, well, what puts a smile on your face? What's the thing that makes us universally happy? And we started to chance upon this sort of idea of sometimes you grab a bite to eat. Me and David might be in New York City mm-hmm. and oh, I've just finished a tasting and we've got another one at seven. So we go and grab a quick bite to eat somewhere. And it's just that one time in 10 where they say, do you want to see the dessert menu or do you want something sweet at the end? And you go, yeah, actually, I quite fancy something sweet and delicious and flavorful. Mm-hmm. And that got us onto it. It's kind of like that time where that one time you go, oh, I'm just going to grab a wee cake, you know, I'm just going to take a cake or something sweet. Mm-hmm. That was the idea. And that really got the creative juices flowing. And we started right now, well, if you were to make a cake in a glass, a Glenmorangie in a glass that was a cake, what would it taste like? 
And we started to write out tasting notes. We were talking about tropical fruits. We were talking about pastry. We were talking about a little bit of cinnamon spice. And we wrote out all these tasting notes. Then we had to set out and turn the fruity and floral spirit of Glenmorangie into something that tasted like an amazing cake. Mm -hmm. So that took us down. We looked at some sherries, some of the lighter sherries, some of the finos and the manzanillas and stuff like that, which give that nutty and salty thing. We looked at some red wines, some more discreet sort of pinot red wines. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would work. But one that we knew about, and this is 100% Dr. Bill. Dr. Bill had worked with Tokai in the past, and it had made something that was great but was just getting a little bit too sweet and too strong because he left it in the cast too long. So that took us back to the amazing Hungarian dessert wine of Tokai. It's Tokai is very sweet, it's very decadent. It's got a classic tasting of pineapple that hooks it together with Glenmorangie original. But at the same time, the casks, they're European oak, but they're Hungarian oak. So it's the, the Quercus roba are growing in Hungary. And that means it's rich in tannins, but it's not as full-on tannic as Spain, nothing's more tannic than Spain, mm -hmm. and it's not as tannic as French oak. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of tannins, but not far too many tannins. And that means you get the sweetness of the wine, but you get this rounded tannic spicy note from the oak as well. And when you put that all together, it makes this whiskey that tasted just like this set of tasting notes we kind of wrote out in our minds four years before when we had the idea for this whiskey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. I'm drinking it right now. <laughs> Thank you. We are super happy about this. So, you know, it hit the markets a month or so ago, but we had this whiskey ready earlier this year. That's just how we work. You know, we get it, we get it out of a cask and then we start, with, and we knew this was something special. A tiny splash of water. I would recommend everyone who gets their hands in a bottle, try it neat, of course. I always say that but just one or two of water, and I think it just becomes multi-layered. Mm. Was that you opening your bottle, David? It was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually really drunk it with a dash of water uh -huh. before, and I, I don't know why. I haven't either. So uh, it's time for me to do that right now. Uh, well, speaking of happy, the nose on this is very, very happy. Very the nose on this mm. is smiling broadly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's got a nice pair of legs on it. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> this color is so pretty it's the kind that i want to stick out on my fence at sunset and take a picture yes. through the glass with the the pink and orange yes sky mm -hmm. behind it especially mm -hmm. considering the packaging on this with all the pink and oh orange. yeah yeah so, so the cool thing that happened with the color so it's actually deeper in color than we expected we had to balance out the color so we described the color as like deep copper, I believe, or, or burnished copper, mm -hmm. one of the two. Yes, indeed. And Bill said, he said, wow, it's, it's darker than expected. That's, it's not so much coming from the time in the Tokai cast, which is a couple of years. It's more, it's that tannic Hungarian oak that gives that color. Mm -hmm. But he said, it's like a deep copper. But then he took a sip and he was like, gee whiz, as Dr. Bill says a lot. He's like, gee whiz. <laughs> the color is deep copper, he says, but the flavor is pure technicolor. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So... It says it's limited edition. It sounds like this is something so passionate that it shouldn't be a limited edition. Why did you guys choose to make it limited? Uh, various reasons. So when you when you start an experiment, you know, we didn't know if we were going to achieve our goal or not. And frankly, I think we we got a 10 out of 10 on this one. Mm -hmm. So you never know. Tokai is this tiny region in Hungary. So you're limited by your cash supply. Ah. Mm -hmm. These are things. And also it's something that's out there to be fun, you know, to like just show off this, show Glen Morangy in a different light, an equally amazing light, but a different light from the, the, the more traditional sherry cask, mm -hmm. port cask, and the full ex-bourbon cask. So it's, it's all of those reasons. But I must say that there's been such a response to this whiskey that I don't think we'll do you know, hey, guess what? A Taylor Cake, we said it was limited. It's now fully available. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just not true. But it's definitely, I think it's at a chord. It struck a chord with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess looking a little more at flexing that sweet but flavorful. And I think that's one thing to really bring to life for anyone who hasn't tasted it yet. Mm -hmm. Some people go, it's not just sugar. And I'm like, no, it isn't. You know, it's not a tale of sugar. Mm -hmm. Cakes are <laughs> sweet. Well, cakes are flavorful. Cakes are delicious yeah. and complex and flavorful. So it's fruity, 
and it's savoury and it's sweet. It's not just the sugar. Well, but that's definitely got to go going, you know. Maybe we can look forward to a tale of pie and a tale of pudding, <laughs> a, tale, a tale of biscuits. Yeah, David, speaking of reception, I learned about A Tale of Cake through your Facebook posts. Aha. Aha. Great. Uh, talk to us about the reception since you're yeah, closer, you know, it's been, closer to the market, mm-hmm. as it were. It's been really, really exciting and, and heartening to see just how people have responded to A Tale of Cake. Because, you know, the name's a bit different, isn't it? You know, the packaging's very different. Yeah. And, you know, there was always the concern in the back of our minds, was this going to turn people off? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it could be a, an option. But actually, you know, I think the Scotch whiskey industry is well overdue a bit of a shake-up and uh, to lose a bit of its serious nature and uh, stop being quite so stuffy. The liquid, you know, I love Scotch. It sounds like a David Lean film or a Merchant <laughs> Ivory production. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think it's time, you know, the liquid from across Scotland is often so amazing. And maybe we just, we're quite a reserved country, you know, we're quite uh, stoic. We don't like to get, you know, don't want to cause a fuss, you know, don't want to blow our own trumpet. And I think it's time we do a bit more of that and, and show people that single malt Scotch whiskey can be fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, Glenn Morangy's done that. You know, it, it's absolutely wonderful liquid. Why not shout about that in every way possible? Mm-hmm. I think that's how we've done it. Well, David, I used to play trumpet, so I will blow it for you. <laughs> there you go. Brilliant. <laughs> um, um, you know, perhaps it's time to talk Signet. Yes. And sure. when talking Signet, uh, if you would distinguish it, we're not, we're, not, we're not tasting them today, but if you would, Brendan, distinguish these from La Santa and Quinta Ruban, or is it Quinta Ruben? A la Oban. <laughs> yeah, I think that one's a bit more open to interpretation, but Quinta Ruban. Okay, um, Quinta Ruban. Ruban. La Santa and Quinta Ruban. Quinta. Quinta is the most important part. Which are another two of your signature expressions. Yes. So La Santa and Quinta are classic finishes so a finishing sherry for santa oloroso and pedro jimenez sherries we bring in that i guess holiday style flavor you know wintry and spicy and warming and lots of dried fruits and nuts and all this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. happening Mm -hmm. with the quinta it's ruby port finished so ruby port and glenmorangie creates this magic combination so it makes dark chocolate, it makes candied honey, it makes mint. It really exaggerates the floral notes if you add water to it, so it becomes super fragrant and aromatic. Two delicious classic whiskies. Tale of Cake, to me, is closest to Nectar d'Or. So Nectar d'Or we do in Sauternes casks. Mm-hmm. Because the Sauternes is so sweet and the French oak is so tannic, Sauternes is uh, really about the balance of sweet and dry. I find I find nectar very dry, mm-hmm. spicy, dry, savory. Um, I always describe it as like white pepper on top of white chocolate. <laughs> the cake I find is more sponge cake and syrup with a little bit of cinnamon cream. You know, so it's similar but different. Mm-hmm. And in it, just about taste. This is all about being super innovative, really mm-hmm. pushing the boundaries and. Change your distillery character, actually. So Signet is all about experimentation on day one rather than experimenting with, like, I'd say, a 10-year-old liquid that you put into a different cask to, you know, tweak and play with. Uh-huh. Signet is all about changing it. On- yeah, so with Signet, our innovation, and it will continue to, it's, it's not over, but our innovation a lot of the time looks at casks. Age, type of cask, type of oak, finishing lens, Fill strengths. There's so much to look at, and there's so much cool stuff that we're still to do. But you can't trademark stuff, you know. So we did Sonalta PX, the first Pedro Jimenez sherry finish I'd ever heard of, or sherry maturation. But you can't then trademark it and just make Pedro Jimenez only for Glen Morangy. Mm-hmm. Other people will replicate, you know. Other people will copy, they'll imitate, and that's great. But what we decided was we were getting a name for being super innovative and really into experimentation. And then we started looking at, this is before I joined, so I'm talking about the royal we. This is Dr. (laughs) Bill and the team. You know, what can we do differently at the distillery? And to make Scotch whiskey, by law, you have three ingredients. You have malted barley, water, and yeast. Right. That's it. It's just those three ingredients. So they were looking at it going, well, what can we change? 
a distillery's character is pretty consistent year on year. It'll vary a little bit in winter and summer if you have if you have a winter and a summer, whereas you don't <laughs> have in Scotland. It's just drink all year round. Mm-hmm. But change that much. So this, we've started looking at how can we really change the character of Glenmorangie, really go for something different. And we do experiments with yeast. We can't do too much with the water. We started looking at the barley, and the inspiration for Signet came from coffee. So with coffee, you mildly roast the beans, or you give them a good medium roast, or you give them a heavy roast, and it absolutely changes the flavour of that coffee. Mm-hmm. So we decided to do it with barley. So barley's dried under warm air in a kiln. But we decided to go further, and we decided to roast the malted barley. So when you roast it, it burns and it sticks and it catches and it blackens and you change the structure of it. You get these Maillard reactions, Maillard reactions that create different flavor Mm -hmm. and you kill off the sugar inside. So actually it makes no alcohol. So what we do is we take a mix of this high roast chocolate malt, call it 20, 25%, and we mix that together with traditional malted barley and we mix the two together and then we put it into our mash tun, ferment it, and then distill it in the tallest copper pot stills as we have at Glenmorangie. And you create, like, it's still Glenmorangie single malt, but it's a different style. It's like the dark side of Glenmorangie that you create. Then we mature that. And the maturation is just, it's why I have no hair. So I know this is <laughs> podcast, but all my hair has fallen out making Signet. It is a labour of love. It's an incredible, incredible whiskey. But it's hard as hell to make uh-huh. it. So in sherry casks, we mature in virgin oak casks. We use first fill bourbon, huge amount of first fill bourbon. We use second fill. We also use some traditional Glenmorangie that's very old. So you're talking 30, 35, 40 year old Glenmorangies. All of this comes together to make one or two tiny batches a year. That's all. Wow. But it creates something that tastes of, of chocolate, of coffee. It tastes of burnt orange skins. It tastes of tiramisu. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's amazing whiskey. I, I, I love to get to make it. And mm. it's, so it is a little of, it's a pain in the ass to make, but I love making it. Shall we taste it? <laughs> I'll be interested to see what your sample's like, guys, because the bottle of Signet that I, tasted as part of an, an online event last night absolutely I mean, it's always great but the sample of signet that i tasted last night absolutely blew my socks off it mm. was i remarked immediately that's the best signet i've ever tasted hmm. so brendan what's been yeah. going on <laughs> well, i have david i have no, ah, I very good very good I, I do love the nose on this it's important to note that so every single whiskey Every single, single malt whiskey. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> it varies batch to batch. It, it's going to vary. Yeah. Batch. So this is what kills me when someone comes up to me at a whiskey festival, and I know they mean it with positive intent, but they say, oh, the whiskey in 1970 was great because I've tasted it. I tasted a whiskey from 1970, and I tasted a whiskey from today, and the 1970 was better. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then they go, therefore, the whiskey from the 1970s was better, and all whiskey from now is not as good. And at that point, just a little bit of me dies inside, mm-hmm. you know, and I just yeah. I smile and I go, right, I said, that's a hell of a conclusion to draw, is it not? Because what I would then challenge you to do is, have you tasted three batches from the 1970s? Mm. Batch one, two, and three of that year, and three batches from here. What you're noticing is just natural little bits of variation. Some whiskeys go up, some go down. Some go more fruity, some go more floral. You know, mm-hmm. this way, some go that way. It's definitely true. We see more variation in Signet than we do in, say, Glenmorangie Original, which is super tight. Uh-huh. But it's a bit mm-hmm. like if you make you make a chili, you know, you have your patented recipe for chili, or you make like your own curry, or you make a, like a fish stew that's your secret, you know, recipe that you make. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things moving together in there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that ebb and flow. And all of these ingredients have a natural variation in them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Signet's like, it has a hundred moving pieces. Uh-huh. So sometimes you're going to find it more chocolatey. Sometimes you're going to find it more coffee-led. 
And other times you're going to get more of that tart, citrus, orange skin note. Mm-hmm. But it will always be signet. It so, will always have all three of those. And sure, that's when I'll say As an expression, one of its hallmarks is the variation. Well, see, I think that's a hallmark of all single malt scotch, if I'm being yeah. honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I see as single malt scotch. Sometimes I see people with the greatest positive intent losing that, you know? See if I could make whiskey that tasted exactly the same every single time. Every single time, mm-hmm. from now until the future. Mm-hmm. I think part of the magic of whiskey is it's a natural product. There's no interference. It's three raw materials, mm-hmm. barley, water, yeast, and it's casks. All of these things are either alive or have been alive until very recently. Mm-hmm. You know, nothing's laser cut in a factory to within a micron. You know, so there's all this natural variability. But with Sigma, it is something that, that varies a little more. Uh-huh. Sometimes more coffee, sometimes more chocolate. Mm-hmm. But it does, as David says, one thing, David, that's happening is Signet is starting to become a little bit more popular. There's no denying Signet is a very difficult story to tell. I mean, I know I speak too much and I speak too long. But I was, <laughs> no. Oh, you why weren't did you laugh at that? I'm really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> the truth hurts. There's no elevator story for Signet. Aha, uh-huh. yeah. How long have you guys been making the Signet? How long has it been out on the market? I've known, I've seen it for a while, but it's always too expensive for me to get. So. Yeah, so it comes around to, it's been made for about 10 or 11 or 12 years now. But okay. it's so complicated a story to tell that really it spread word, to, uh, it spread word of mouth, you know, because we, we quite understood how to tell people how to bring to life everything that we do to make this amazing whiskey. So taking a while. But Recently, we've just noticed that more and more people, that word of mouth spread has started to grab some attention. So people are now starting to buy it more. So one of the things that's helping, David, is we're making it in like slightly larger batches. Yeah. Still tiny batches, but they're slightly larger. So it just allows everything to, you know, come together and mingle and marry and just bind. It's just It's just becoming a little bit more integrated at the moment than it has been maybe two or three years ago. Mm. So the mouthfeel on the Signet, David, I think you know from our previous interview back in August, Mm -hmm. for me, mouthfeel is where it's at. And this has a wonderfully oily, chewy mouthfeel. And, you know, I I like whiskey I can eat as well as drink. Well, that's why we gave you the cake. (laughs) Yeah. And there's also a spiciness there. Yes. Yes, indeed. (laughs) But I think Signet, you know, has a balance there as well as that incredible mouthfeel you're getting this intentionally uh, there's a side to sigma that's slightly aggressive you know it's got this spiciness in there and that's there on purpose you know to create some of the balance and the excitement Mm -hmm. in the final whiskey yeah 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 no i really thoroughly enjoy it and i think i told you last time we talked david that there was a local bar that was selling a bottle for really cheap considering although it was still expensive but it was really cheap (laughs) so (laughs) i did buy it and i have saved two ounces, one for me and one for my sister because she's all into coffee. So next time I see her, I'm going to bring it up. She's not a big whiskey fan, but I think this one might change her mind. So here's the question for you. And this Mm -hmm. might be a toughie because it's kind of like asking you which of your children is your favorite. But out of all the Glenmorangie expressions, what are your favorite three? Favorite three. So first of all, I love this question because you haven't said what's your favorite you know, and it's it's impossible. Mm-hmm. It's impossible to pick your favorite. You know, it's like asking someone who's your favorite kid. Right. And I say that honestly, and I only have one. <laughs> Brendan, wait till you have two. It's an easy question. But if you had four <laughs> kids, you'd have to leave one out. Right. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's hilarious because there's like conspiracy theorists out in the whiskey world who think I'm making it up. But hand on heart, the whiskey that I familiarize myself with Glen Moran Jean most, the one that I drink the most of, the one that I love, truly love, is Glen Morangy Original. Mm-hmm. Nice. I'm a sucker for whiskey and ex bourbon casks. It's not my only style, but it's my go to style. I figured that out from, you know, 10 years of sort of drinking whiskey before I then sort of professionally started getting into it. And I can now go back and go, oh my God, it's, there's definitely a theme there. Mm-hmm. I'm not a huge fan of a sherry bomb, but I do love sherry influence. I love smoke. I love this. I love that. But interestingly, I would say I prefer smoky whiskey to non-smoky whiskey. But Interesting. I, I don't necessarily love smoky Glenmorangie. 
even though it's delicious and it's tasty and it's incredible, it's not what I'm looking for when I want a Glenmorangie. So my absolute love was Glenmorangie original. Um, that's definitely my top three. And then I think it's a variation on that theme is why I love Glenmorangie as that much. And that was a really cool moment is where I just kept, a bit like David with Bill's business card, when I got the job to work for Bill, I just kept chapping on his door saying, let's make an Aster, let's make an Aster. Aster mm-hmm. and designer casks, all for Bill, really special casks. And Bill was kind of saying, well, we've done that. We don't really want to go back. But eventually I put one in front of him that was so good. He went, yeah, let's do it. So we released the 2017 Aster. <laughs> so it's that bourbon oak thing makes me love Gwen Morangy original. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, I get to taste all the special editions and stuff like that, but I think it's familiarity that brings out the most love for me, you know. I get to work with them so often, so I absolutely adore Signet. I hate making it. I hate making it. <laughs> it's so fidgety and footery and all these Scottish words. and It's like, I don't know, I guess it's the Mariah Carey of whiskey. It's <laughs> such a deep, and you need to make every single thing work for it. Mm-hmm. But when you get it, just like Mariah Carey, you know, it hits every octave that you can possibly hear. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then my third favourite Glenmorangie, Glenmorangie original, Glenmorangie Signet, David's favourite, as I'm going to say, uh-huh. the 18. I think the Glenmorangie. Oh, mm-hmm. I love the 18. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's the best 18 year old. Uh, I do too. I think it just stands up there. And I, I love the way it tastes first and foremost. I love the complexity. I love the floral, the fruity. I love that spicy, nutty thing. Mm-hmm. I put this into one bottle, everything that Glenmorangie stands for. You know, we stand mm-hmm. for fruity and floral spirit. We stand for stuff that's crisp and clean. We stand for stuff that's delicious. But we're also famous for maturing an ex-bourbon, and it's mostly matured an ex-bourbon. Mm-hmm. But we're also iconic for pioneering uh, the process of cask finishing. And this has a parcel of cask-finished sherry whiskey. So... Yeah, those would be my three. Okay. Those would be my three. I like all three. You add to this list. <laughs> if you I want. do like all three. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to go 18 cake signet for my three for you guys. My, um, my, I've always said Glemo 18 is my choice for Desert Island. You know, if I'm stranded on a desert island and know that this will be my last ever bottle, mm. it would be Glemo on G18. I, I, I really, I, you know, it's not that I don't love Glamorangie in just American oak. It's wonderful. But I really do love when I think there are certain occasions when Glamorangie just absolutely nails it with a finish. And 18 is a partial finish. And I think exactly Brendan said, you know, it's just so, it's so exuberant. But at the same time, it's clinical. There's absolutely no fluff. There's no vagaries about the taste profile. It, it does what it does so well. I just absolutely love 18 for that. And the other two, not to sound like a spoiled brat here, but <laughs> years ago we had a, a limited release Glamorangi Margot finish, and I can't get that one out of my head. It's just spectacular, mm. the Glamour Margot mm. finish. And then the other one, uh, Glamorangi Artain, one of the very first of the 10-year projects of private editions, and Artain was finished in Super Tuscan mm. red wine barrels from a particular vineyard in uh, Tuscany whose name translates to mean from stone. And I can't tell you what it is, but you can Google it. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Uh, shall we talk cocktails? Yes. Brendan, yeah. Brendan, as director of the cocktail collection, I'm forever being asked, what's your favorite cocktail? And like you, in response to what's your favorite whiskey, I respond as if. Why would I limit myself to one? Because there are so many wonderful cocktails. Indeed. So, you know, what we ask our guests is, do you have a go-to category? So I have a couple of go-to categories. I'm a sucker for old fashions. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like fashions is I think, and I I agree with this, I know there's some traditionalists, but I think it can vary and you can riff on it. You can vary the bitters. You can vary the level of ice and the level of dilution. You can vary the base whiskey. And you make a lot of stuff work. So so I love old fashions. I like my cocktails boozy, I would say. I want to have something that's quite strong. You can really taste the alcohol in there. Yep. So even a gin and tonic, if, if people are taking a gin and tonic for me, you know, I, I want to pour the tonic in myself because I, I like it quite 
as opposed Absolutely. to oh, so it's gin with a splash of tonic. That's it. That's exactly. <laughs> that's right. how it should be. I always yeah. call it a gin and tonic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why gin is first, not tonic and gin. <laughs> exactly. When I was sorry to butt in, but when I before I got into even liking whiskey uh, in my kind of my student years, when I was back in Edinburgh and met up with mates, there was a bar called Montpellier's. It's very f- fancy bar, and uh, we used to go there. And I started drinking gin and tonics then, and then I discovered that the and it was Plymouth. You know, not calling out anything. I do like Plymouth a lot, I have to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, I discovered that the bar had Plymouth gin and Navy Strength Plymouth at the same price. Aha! Wow! <laughs> the bar. So I stopped drinking double gin and tonics and started drinking single Navy Strength mm-hmm. and tonics. Well, there you yeah. go. Someone there. Someone there uh, is not a chemical engineer. <laughs> 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 so speaking of old fashions, I see in our cake sample, in our tale of cake sample, that there's a cake old fashioned recipe. Mm-hmm. Who came up with that recipe? It sounds delicious. And I think I'm going to make one. As part of the press kit, we got several recipes developed by uh, Jeremy LeBlanche. Yes. 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 Yeah, Jeremy LeBlanche. So we collaborated on cake with Dominic Ansel, mm-hmm. the inventor of the cronut. Super. The cronut. Mm-hmm. Ah, the cronut man. Yeah, super imaginative patisserie chef from France, based in New York City. Mm-hmm. And he had that note straight away that cake has. Jeremy LeBlanche made up some cocktails for us. I have to be honest, when he first proposed an old fashioned, so again, I have the best job on earth. So all the cocktail variants that worked on got sent to me, and I got to eat them all personally and grade them. But I was like, I raised an eyebrow. When I seen an old fashioned, I thought, mm, it's not where I would have went with this. But that's why I'm a whiskey maker, not a cocktail <laughs> maker. And it really, it really, really, really works. It does. So, yeah, I love it. The other great old fashioned for me, I think hands down, I would say hands down the best old fashioned I've had is Keen to Ruban, which is our Glenmondry port finish. Mm-hmm. Orange bitters, old fashioned. That to me is just chocolate orange bars melted down in whiskey. It's phenomenal. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and interestingly, so I know a lot of people love hard bag old fashions, but it doesn't work for me. I don't mm. like the smoky old fashioned. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want okay. orange with my smoke. Mm-mm. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Now, the other cocktails, is, like I say, it's boozy works for me. When I'm not drinking whiskey, I'm a sucker for a martini, mm-hmm. um, a dirty martini, a Vesper. Mm-hmm. These kind of things I, I love. I actually prefer a martini over a Manhattan, if I'm being totally honest. <gasps> what? Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, like, a, what? I'll, I'll rescue you. What about a smoky martini? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually made those. Those are not bad. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. yeah. Love it. I keep challenging cocktail makers because I know it's in there. So the salinity of Ardbeg, the Ardbeg 10 salinity, I want a dirty Ardbeg martini. Yeah. And I know it works, but I've not... I've had ones that are 7 out of 10s, but I know there's a 10 out of 10 out there. Mm-hmm. Now, you know what I'd want to do with an art bag? I'd want to make some sort of a bacon cocktail with that. Yeah. My so, smoky bacon. So art bag Bloody Mary. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a big fan of the Bloody Mary, but I could go there. Yeah. Oh, so you know the Bloody Caesars with the Clamato juice in Canada? Yeah. I don't know that one. Oh, yeah. So Clamato yeah. instead of... Instead of tomato juice, it's it's like oysters and clams. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, clam juice is the, the lovely, highly appealing ingredient. <laughs> that, that does sound good. A, yes. Sort of bloody Caesar. And then when you do that and you add like pork belly or bacon, mm-hmm. just, yeah, it just makes life wonderful. Ardbeg whiskey and oyster liquor. Yeah. yeah. I'm there. It's it's good. Well, oyster. <laughs> that's what they call. That's what I'm from New Orleans. The oyster water. We call it oyster liquor. Interesting. Yeah, indeed. Uh, yes. We're not alone in that. But. And then the last one that I love. <laughs> the last one I love that kind of neatly ties up my entire career. So before I joined the whiskey industry, I worked in pharmaceuticals. Aha! Uh-huh. I see where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's genuinely true. So for two years of my life, I made penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> and these days, penicillins are Glenmorangy, Ardbeg, and Honey Ginger. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you have gone from making penicillin to... Making penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Do we know how long the limited edition will last on shelves? 
Yeah, so David will definitely know this better than me, but genuinely, genuinely, I'm not a salesman. I'm not a salesman, and this is not some crap that we're pulling to try and drive sales, saying, oh, it's super limited. It's genuinely a single batch. Wow. It's not super tiny. These aren't numbered bottles. It's not that kind of tiny batch, but I expect it will sell out in a couple of months. Wow. Uh If you taste it and you like it, buy it. If you taste it and you really like it, Maybe buy two. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I think it's priced really fairly, frankly. And do you know what? If you taste it and this one isn't for you, maybe this is the one that you let slide. Oh, no. This one's definitely for me. <laughs> yeah. And genuinely, it will be gone. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So buy two bottles because then you can have your cake and drink it too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is it bad that I've got five bottles so far? <laughs> no. <laughs> To answer the question about cake, if you're familiar with the 10 years where we've done the private edition Glenmorangie range, it's a similar kind of quantity of bottles to those annual releases. And this one has been a roaring success. So I don't expect there really to be anything left of it come January. It'll be gone. As Brendan says, we've probably got a month or two of seeing it on shelves and it'll it'll be gone. And Brendan, there's no way we can turn this into an annual release? Like if we beg? No, you <laughs> told me, you know, three, four years ago to lay down a succession of them kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But that's how whiskey works, you know. That's how whiskey you works. can bring it back. They've been bringing back TV shows left and right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Only as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea for a cream cocktail involving cake. Ooh. Okay. It's called icing on the cake. Oh, nice. Cool. And it could be a little whipped cream topper. Yeah, it could be a topper. Yeah, icing on the cake. Anyway, nice for what it's worth. Nice. A delight. Yes. Guys, this has been wonderful. Brennan, it was so good to get to know you and to learn all about your wonderful journey and how cake was created and Signet and all these other wonderful deliciousnesses that you uh, <laughs> help produce. Ah, uh, sure. It's a pleasure. And David, it's always a pleasure to have you along. My pleasure. I believe you guys have either a webcast or a podcast that you guys do together weekly? So we do an Instagram live. Uh-huh. Ah, late tonight so we're going to do it 30 minutes ago but we had too much oh sorry too much fun with (laughs) that that's all right right. (laughs) yes most wednesdays we do whiskey word wednesdays so david and i the original plan was we'd speak for 30 minutes on instagram live about just one word in the whiskey and try and do some myth busting and just answer questions for people but we actually talk for an hour and we get cut off by uh, mr zuckerberg and instagram Uh so <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Most Wednesday, 7 p.m. UK time, which tends to be 2 p.m. Eastern. Nice. Yeah. Where David is in Texas. We'll, we'll just talk about one whiskey word. So you'll find us most weeks on a Wednesday. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us, and we will let you get to your Instagram. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers, guys. Bye bye. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. The Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection and LA Food and Drink Museum, has a YouTube channel featuring a mix of how to, lively talk, and culinary entertainment. Already streaming are Cocktails, The Grand Tour, Culinary Quickies, Music and Booze with Mo, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey. New shows coming soon include Complete Greek, telling the story of Greek food one dish at a time, and Spirits of Rum, a podcast featuring personalities from the wide world of cane spirits. Find us on YouTube, the Center for Culinary Culture, and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, telling the story of food and drink one taste at a time. Hey, Louise, how are you doing this week? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Fantastic. Anyway, this week we are going to talk about, we we just got off the phone with Brendan and David from Glen Morangi, and we talked about a tale of cake and signet. And I sent samples over uh, both of those to you and wanted to see what you uh, decided to do with it. Well, I 
felt like I absolutely had to use the Glenmorangia tail of cake in cake. Yay. <laughs> yeah, great. And then just keep the other one to drink for myself. Of course. Of course. Yeah, I mean, listen, as I tasted it, I was like, oh yeah, this does taste like cake. Do I just pair this with homemade frosting? Because I think that would be fine. Mm. But <laughs> but no, I, I was like, all right, well, I want to make a cake. And then I was thinking I want to make a type of soaked cake. So I don't know if you grew up with this, but I feel like there's a handful of my Southern relatives that made this type of bunt cake and it was it's just called an old-fashioned butter cake that is baked in a bunt okay and it's really simple it's super basic it, it's sugar eggs flour butter a lots of it and a few extra things but other than that it's a really really simple cake but one of the things that you do is after it comes out of the oven you poke a bunch of holes in the bottom of it and you make a glaze that can be it can have alcohol in it. It can have, it has but more butter in it. Sometimes it has lemon juice. Sometimes it has vanilla. It really, you can kind of like season it the way you want, but I'm like, oh, I'm definitely going to make a glaze using cool. this particular whiskey. And so you dump that over the top of it with all these holes poked into it. And then you let it sit while it cools and all of that soaks down into the cake. So when you flip it over to unmold it out of the bunt pan, you have this really like moist, decadent, buttery, boozy, super delicious cake for, mm. you know, could be after dinner, could be a middle of the day situation. And I was thinking like, well, I prefer dessert in the afternoon with a cup of coffee because I'm always too full after a meal, usually. I, so mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, this would be perfect with just a, a bit of that whiskey in my coffee. Right. As well as a piece of this cake. So that was the direction I went. Mm, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, coffee, butter, and whiskey, <laughs> like in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> the winning comedy. Yeah. I thought it was a really interesting flavor. I mean, it was sweet, but it wasn't overly sweet, which I liked about it. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And you know, I thinking about those barrels as well, like really had me thinking about this butter cake is rich and is sweet. That is kind of the point of it. And uh -huh. I think that's how, but you know, when tasting the whiskey, cause I was hesitant, I do not really enjoy too sweet of whiskeys, especially, yeah. but it didn't taste like it wasn't cloying the way I thought it was going to be. I guess that's what I thought it was going to be, and it absolutely was not. So I'm like, okay, this will work just fine in this case. Right, right. So Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I'll have to add that to my recipe book and pull it out um, and try it. You should. It's a, like absolutely perfect thing to be when you're sitting around during the holidays and it's like you'll use any excuse, you know, to say, oh, I can totally have a piece of cake soaked in alcohol <laughs> and alcohol in my coffee at eight o'clock in the morning, like waiting for Santa. Nice. <laughs> waiting, or well, you're not waiting for Santa, <laughs> waiting to open the gifts that Santa left you. Right, right, right. Well, awesome. Cool. Well, I'm very happy that we discussed this tale of cake. I was wondering if you'd do this one or Signet, because both of them I thought had very interesting flavor profiles. Signet is more of a coffee chocolate, but it's yeah. not, I don't find it as sweet as the tale of cake. However, I don't, I still don't find tale of cake overly sweet which is cool. So thank you so much for your suggestions and your cake idea. And as I said, I'm going to add it to my book and we will catch up with you next week. Sounds great. Talk to you then. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles, as well as tasting notes and recommendations from today's World of Wheezy. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, salam. Salam shabbat. You can become a sustaining supporter of Spirits of Whiskey by making a monthly donation. Just visit the Spirits of Whiskey page at anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm forward slash spirits dash of dash whiskey and click on the support button. And if you really like us, give us a five star rating and a review. Thank you. Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.